So your husband left you for another woman while y'all were still in the cult? I didn't know anything. I was so indoctrinated. I thought everybody was evil. I didn't know how to look a man in the eye because I had been in this thing for so long. Mothers in ATI never feel that they've measured up. Thousands of ex-cult members are speaking out about their experience in the Shiny Happy People cult. And we've talked to a lot of ex-members who grew up in the Shiny Happy People cult. But we haven't heard a lot from parents that were a part of the cult. And today, we have an incredibly special guest, a mom who raised her kids in the IBLP cult. I'm really excited to talk to her today. Uh, I'm here with my good friend and former cult member, Bryce. Bryce, how you doing? I'm doing all right. Getting good. This, uh, looking forward to this interview all week. Yeah, this is going to be a, a good one. And and joining us from Canada is our very special guest, Christine Fowler. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. This is a privilege. Well, I'm excited to talk to you and hear about your experience. Like I was saying, you know, Bryce and I both grew up in the cult, right? We spent a lot of our adolescent years in the shiny happy people cult and you know we've talked to a lot of other people that also grew up like that uh, and a lot of our experiences are, are very similar but what we don't hear a lot about is the parents experience in the shiny happy people cult how they got into the cult why they decided to join you know their feelings on uh, Bill Gothard and leaving the cult and so that's why I'm so interested to hear about your story. You've actually written a book about it and we'll be talking about that as well. Uh, but tell me a little bit about how you were originally exposed uh, to IBLP and Bill Gothard. Well, I met my first husband on a plane and the plane was going from Newfoundland to Toronto. And um, <clears throat> we sat together through a series of circumstances. We ended up sitting together and we thought, this must be the Lord. But I was a Catholic at the time, and he had just become, become a born-again Christian. So he went to Toronto. I went on to Calgary, where I was teaching school, and um, we started writing. And, you know, like, it was like, are you a Christian? You know, like, yeah, like, I'm a Catholic, I'm Christian. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, he started talking to me about this seminar he had gone to at the Queensway Cathedral in Toronto, and he said, by this Bill Gothard person. And so anyway, our, I thought, well, th well, that's nice, you know. And so anyway, he, um, we, we kept communicating and I ended up in Toronto and he took me to a basic seminar. And honestly, that was my very first um, introduction to born again Christianity. Like, because mm. he had been talking about things like being saved, witnessing, giving your life to the Lord, uh, all those things, like, we didn't talk about that in the Catholic Church. That just wasn't part of our terminology. And so anyway, you know, I, I learned a little bit about it, about it when I went to the, the basic seminar. And at the end of the week, you know, like, I was, I was enthralled, but I felt like the most wretched, miserable sinner you could ever imagine. And the only way that I understood to not feel like that was to give my life to the Lord right away. So I did. And then next thing you know, um, we got, you know, like after a time, we ended up getting married. And um, I went to my first advanced seminar with a nursing baby in tow. OK. Oh, wow. So, yeah, like it was and like I had to travel from um, Quebec, eastern Quebec to Toronto for this. And so I went for the beginning of the week and he came after he finished work on uh, for the Friday and Saturday of the advanced seminar. And when Bill Gothard started talking about um, home education, it was like, uh, okay, well, I've got a nursing baby because we ain't doing that. That's all there is to it. But my, <laughs> my husband was absolutely enthralled. And all I could think of was um, he'll have I've got this nursing baby, my first, he'll have like six years or more to get, a, get that idea out of his head, but he never did. And so, you know, initially, you know, like we, we went to the seminars, we brought them to our church, you know, we were, and at this point in time, I had given my life to the Lord and we were going to a, a mildly Pentecostal church. 
And oh um, wow, you wait, you, you know, went from Catholic to Pentecostal? <laughs> I actually did. And you know, <laughs> oh boy, what a culture lived, shock. We, it it was. It it was unreal. Like I mean, we're talking um in the first Pentecostal church we went to, it was like arms in the air Pentecostal, slain in the spirit Pentecostal, uh kissing everybody and and I just I hated it. And we moved from that that town, so I, and it was all French, right? Because we were in Quebec, and I didn't speak French at the time. And so anyway, then we moved to Montreal, and we found another church there, and it was it was Pentecostal, but very mildly Pentecostal. And oh, okay. so we we started attending there, and the pastor had actually heard of Bill Gothard, and he had gone to some of the pastor's seminars. So of course, knowing that we had gone to the basic and the advanced, we approached him with bringing the seminar to our church. And we did several times. And, um, you know, most people just took all this Gothard stuff with a grain of salt. And, you know, if anybody had checked out the scriptures, and some did, they said that they just don't match up. But we thought Bill Gothard was such a neat guy, you know, that, I mean, the little guy in the blue suit, how could you resist? And, you know, my ex-husband was so enthralled with him he used to practice speaking like bill gothard in front of the mirror i mean that's that's the hold that that man had wait then, practice you know, hang on hang on because we've talked about we've talked about the the humble servant wife voice uh with our friend grace morton um michelle duggar breathy yeah high-pitched breathy, that breathy. Yeah, oh, high yeah, pitched, yeah, breathy yeah, voice yeah. but your husband Childish. was trying to imitate uh, the voice of Bill Gothard. How interesting. He's got a specific cadence. Oh, yes. Well, it, and, and pausing at the right time, like he would stand in front of the mirror and, well, if you want to know how to overcome your bitterness, you have to blah, blah, blah. You know, and, and this that was is, really good. Know, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. I flashed but, back know, for a second. He, <laughs> Oh, he was totally enthralled with it. And so, you know, um, when it was time, when, you know, my, my oldest, I, I, I ended up, had, I had two children by this time. <clears throat> and when the first one was six, five or six, we thought, well, we're going to apply for ATI. And I mean, my ex decided we were going to apply for ATI. So we applied and we were rejected because our son wasn't old enough. So they said, you know, apply next year. So we said, okay. And I thought, whew, I've had another year to live, um, basically. And so anyway, but, but we were still, when I met my, my husband, even before we were married, he kept trying to tell me, you know, like you shouldn't be wearing, like I'm short. So he says, you know, like these dresses or whatever you were wearing, you can see down the front. He said, nobody's allowed to see that but me. And so like, you know, I started wearing stuff up to here, but I was still wearing pants and all that. And um, then, you know, the, the following year, we did uh, apply again for ATI. And, um, you know, we, we filled out the whole thing. We got the references. We signed all the things, no TV, no pants for the women, and everybody would be in the program. And my husband had to shave off his mustache. You know what it's like. I didn't even know there was an application process to become a part of ATI. I had no idea. So parents were submitting forms, signing agreements as far as dress Absolutely. code. Absolutely. Wow. I, I Absolutely. didn't know. This was in um, 1993. 93. And so anyway, um, you know, well, just to show you, I mean, we were accepted at that at that point. But some of our friends uh, saw what we were into, and they wanted to get into it, too. And they were not accepted because there were things because you had to send a family picture. And if it was any facial hair in that family picture, you had to either get rid of it or don't go. And so there were things that they had filled out in, in their application form that uh, apparently weren't acceptable, probably to the students who were reading the applications, because we all know there were no adults down there. The, it was just students, right? right? Yep. The and family so, coordinators, I think they were called, which ours yeah. must have failed miserably, because if they had done even a light inspection, they would have been like, what is going on in here? <laughs> 
Uh, my mom oh likes my the gosh. news. We yeah, gotta watch no the news. Kidding. Yep. And so anyway, like our, our friends, they um, they were not accepted because there were things they had to fix. So they said, you have to do this, 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 this. And there was a list, as we all know about the lists. And anyway, uh, they said, reapply next year. And so they did. And they got in the next year. But, you know, going to Knoxville for the first time. Mm, yeah, um, the annual conference. You know, yeah and and i mean like it was that was that was the heyday of of ati and um we'd be driving from montreal down to there and there'd be these great big vans ati or bust you know yep. this type of thing written in the back and you know but the thing is is before we went the first time i only had one dress all the rest were pants and uh -oh. sweats and, and shorts. That's not going to work. We know that. <laughs> and well, I, I, yeah, no kidding. And I said, well, I don't want to go. This this is insane. I'm sitting there the night before we left to drive to Knoxville the first time, and my suitcase is sitting there, and there's one dress in it, and you know some personal stuff, and that's it. And I'm crying, and you know, like at that point, my husband would have moved heaven and earth for me to be on board. So we said, you know what? We're going a few days early anyway. So we're going to go to Gatlinburg and, and, and Pigeon Forge and we will go shopping. And I thought, yeah, okay, I, I'm on. And so I thought, well, I'm going to get a whole new wardrobe. And so off we went to Pigeon Forge and we went to all the outlets and I came home with a suitcase full of clothes and I was just so happy, you know? And so anyway, I wore all this stuff to the, the seminar the first time and I just, I looked around and I thought, gee, I, I fit in, you know, and you look at the mm. big banner at the top there, giving the world a new uh, approach to life mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and all these pregnant women and everything. It was just, oh my God, you know, and I dared ask one, when is your baby due? And she says, I'm not pregnant. <laughs> I almost died. <laughs> I learned to shut up pretty fast, but, oh, but you know, I fit in. <laughs> I fit in when I was there, but when I went back home, um, yeah, I didn't really fit in so well, you know, with these long dresses and skirts and the hair and, you know, the hair pinned back just so, and it was getting longer and longer. And, oh my, I never, nobody ever saw me in a pair of pants again for the next 15 years. Wow. And I mean, we're talking bicycling, going for a walk, hiking, you name it. It was and, and you know, uh, I grew to actually not mind it. But, you know, like it, it just felt wrong. And, and it made me really look at my family, like my mother and my three sisters. Well, they're going straight to hell because look at them in their bikinis and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I mean, me in my modest bathing suit at one point. I mean, I mortified my parents, but that's basically how I got into um, ATI. You know, like you could say I was dragged by the hair screaming and howling because I married at 30. And by the time we got into the ATI, you know, I was a few years older again. And I thought, oh, all my friends have school aged children and I have babies and I have to stay home. And I want to go out shopping and for coffee and do the, the things, you know, that, that normal people do. And I couldn't. Mm. So, you know, when we were in ATI, literally, I had a breakdown every four weeks. And it was usually coinciding with the time that we had to fill out the reports. You know, the monthly reports. After you finish the wisdom booklet, you had to fill out these reports. And how do you fill out a report? on these little tiny children, seven years mm -hmm. old and five years old, and you're teaching them science and all this stuff, they should have been out playing in the mud. You know what I mean? Right, right. It, it was really, really tough. So like I, I had meltdowns regularly and you know, I don't know, we kept trying to justify it. We had to answer to the school board and everything and that wasn't easy, but I had been a school teacher. So I could mm. speak with conviction. Yeah, some level of authority, right? Absolutely. And, you know, everything they threw at me, I could say, well, you know, we really think that this program is A1 because blah, blah, blah. And, you know, I'm a former teacher, so I can, I know what my kids need. And, and I really did. 
know what they needed. But I mean, I did teach my oldest how to read from the Bible and it mm. <laughs> broke my heart, you know. And then, you know, you talk about the family coordinator. Um, we had two guys come to the house probably in our second year in ATI. My kids were still quite small and they were, you know, disobedient. And, you know, we didn't have a prayer room for encouragement like some <laughs> people. But, um, you know, these, <laughs> these two guys came, you know, to the house. And I won't say their names because... God love them if they ever, you know, if they ever end up watching anything like this. But, you know, one of them said to me, you know, Christine, um, your little one is really not obeying you. And he's just taunting you. And, you know, he's he's just trying to do all, all he can. And that was our introduction. They introduced us to the Pearl style mm. of spanking to train up a child. And... Oh my God, like it was, it was not good. I mean, I was supposed to be the mother. I was supposed to be loving my children. And here I was teaching them, bawling them out, having a breakdown and spanking them with this rod. And I kept breaking the rod because, you know, it was just some flimsy little dowel, you know? Yeah. And so then I got somebody to make me a, um, uh, a paddle, <laughs> like a paddle for like, it was meant to hang on the wall with painting on it and all that type of thing. And so I bought this thing for $15 from somebody and I said, that's the new rod. And that's what we used and it never broke. And, but it, it broke my heart and it broke mm. my kids' spirits. The, yeah. the fact that the Institute was sending representatives to your house to essentially conduct an inspection on how you were raising and, and punishing even your children, almost like here in the States, yeah. uh, Child Protective Services. But these are cult representatives yeah. traveling out to your home yeah. to make sure you're doing things right. I mean, that's just, I, I, I don't, I never I don't saw know. I, I never had that experience. I, I don't know, Bryce, no. if you did. Um, never saw it, never heard about it. And, and maybe, maybe once again, this is just our perspective as kids that grew up in the cult maybe yeah. our parents did have to deal with this yeah. and, and i had no idea i mean i vaguely remember the monthly yeah. report thing i didn't know about the application oh. process i had no idea about the home visits so this is all just this is just crazy to me i bet yeah i bet it has more to do with in the very early days like they were denying people's applications they could they were turning people away and people were desperate to get in and as it got further along they're like well maybe we'll just start accepting more people and oh we can't let's not send everybody into the homes maybe they just needed more they wanted more people signed up for for revenue maybe possibly yeah to fund I, I all mean, the things because i barely even remember the family coordinator people well our family coordinators it was two guys from they were from ontario actually and they were traveling around to you know one of them had been to moscow and he was there for so long that when he came back, he was basically celiac and lack, uh, uh, dairy intolerant. And he had to travel with his cooler because he couldn't eat any of the food that we had. And he had all this tofu and gluten-free, blah, blah, blah. And it was, it was a sin. But anyway, they're the ones, they came to visit us twice. And once like in the, in the very beginning, and then like I had my third child, um, a few years later, I mean, we used to do our school with the baby lying on the table beside us. And uh, we thought it was really funny. But when these family coordinators came, you know, like they were kids. They yeah. were old enough to drive, but probably not much more. They were kids. And here they were. Oh, Christine, I'm 40 at the time. And here are these kids telling me how to raise my children. And maybe they were right, maybe they were wrong, but you know, like it was horrible. It was absolutely yeah. horrible. And then um, later on when, when, you know, they came a second time and I had a nurse, another nursing baby at that time, I have three children and you know, th things were more palatable. They played with the other boys and they weren't telling us what to do because they could see I was in over my head. But um, one summer, after Knoxville or at Knoxville, there was um, a family from Alberta that we had been friends with. 
and they wanted their daughter to come stay with us for a few months to learn French because we lived in Quebec. So she came and she stayed with us for, I don't know if it was six weeks or two months, but remember, I had a nursing baby and I had two rambunctious boys and we thought she was perfect. And so here I was once again, asking this person who was like 19, you know, like, how do you wear your skirts? And what do you think of this? And in your house, what do you guys do? And I kept feeling like, I'm learning from her. And, you know, I guess, I mean, she was very humble. She was a sweetheart. But the pressure that it put on me to have a nursing baby and these two boys and this image of perfection, ATI perfection. And we brought her to our church and she knew how to make friends. And, you know, when people would say, you know, like, oh, how did you meet, you know, the the Massacots and that was my name then. And she said, oh, they're friends of my parents. She never, ever mentioned ATI, Tennessee, Bill Gothard, nothing. And, you know, she was a lot more accepted because of that, but she dressed weird like us. So they probably knew there was something up. But, you know, that was, you know, I just, I just loved her. But it was the most trying summer imaginable for me in my 40s. I had my, my last baby at 40. In my 40s, to be looking at a youngster and feeling inadequate. Mm, And I guess, you know, inadequacy was what ruled the day. Like moms in ATI, um, we were supposed to be submitting. We deferred to our husbands. We never gave a bad report. Even when things um, in, in our marriage relationship or in our house weren't great, we couldn't talk to anybody. And, you know, here you are. And like, it was so isolating. And, you know, like I mentioned, Davey, in in my note to you that we went through a lot of the same problems and trials as, as, as the students did, as moms, because the fathers literally ruled the roost. And, Mm -hmm. and I don't think that in my marriage, I don't think it was as bad as in some, like I've talked to a lot of people you know, on the ATI parent recovery group. And, and I, since I wrote my book, I've had so many young people, well, they're not young anymore, but people who were raised in ATI have written me. Like my biggest audience uh, for my book has been former students of ATI. Mm -hmm. And they've said things to me like, thank you so much for writing that book. I never understood why my parents made me do the things they did. And uh, your story gave me validation. Or I cried for you and I cried for my mother when I read your book because my mom went through exactly what you went through. Mm. It's really hard for a parent to say, you know what? We walked down the wrong path. We did something really, really wrong. And my ex-husband has not acknowledged to this day. So Davey and I, like, I can't remember thinking that I was in a cult until recently. Like, I don't even think I thought I was in a cult when Recovering Grace came out. It was like, no, it was this weird traumatic thing that I went through. And it it was before Shiny Happy People came out, probably a couple of years ago. But how long, yeah. Davey, were we like, yeah, we just went through this crazy thing and then it's just dawned. Oh, yeah. yeah for, for I mean, for a long time, it, you know, same same thing for me. For a long time, I didn't really perceive it as a cult, right? It was a weird, unfortunate part of my childhood, part of my homeschool experience, right? But I never really looked at it as a cult until I was able to step away. It was really probably about five years after I got out of the cult at 18 that I first started looking at it as, oh, this was a, a high-control high demand group. This was a cult, um, you know? And so I think a lot of folks are, are, are in the same, or at least were in the same position, right? Where you get yeah. out, um, you don't really know what to think about your experience other than, you know, it was, uh, it was intense, right? And you're just glad that you're removed from it. Oh my right? God. Yeah. Um, exactly. But, uh, 
I want to I want to backtrack a little bit here, Christine, because you know there was there was a, a lot of stuff that that you talked about, right? And, and I know you're just kind of marching through the narrative here, but um, you know the whole the whole concept of <laughs> being being a mom in this cult, the concept of being a mother in the shiny happy people cult. I don't think people really understand the pressure that these moms were dealing with, the intensity no. that they experienced, the scrutiny that was just part of their day-to-day -day lives, right? Uh, and, and like you said, you deal yeah. with these feelings of inadequacy and isolation. Um, you're trying to live up to this impossible standard. Um, and, and looking back on it, just thinking about my own mom's experience. I mean, it breaks my heart knowing what she was probably going through at the time. And, and we had no idea. We had no idea because she came from a background that was much more liberal, kind of like you, Christine. Um, yeah. And then, you know, she became born again in her, her early 20s and then got into IBLP. I, I believe it was probably like in her early 30s. Um, and, and so all of a sudden her yeah. life just changed dramatically. Now, the difference between you and, and my mom's experience is my mom was all for it. In fact, she was the one that was pushing for it. And so while it was a huge adjustment, you know, not wearing pants anymore, finding the modest swimsuits, right? Eliminating any kind of worldly influence from the home. It was something that, that she really wanted. Uh, but at the same time, even though she wanted it, I know that she had those feelings of inadequ inadequacy, especially around how oh, many yeah. children, how many children she had was a huge point of conflict for her because I know she wanted to be one of those ATI moms with eight, nine, 10 kids, right? But we had three and, and that was almost <laughs> like, um, it was almost like a dishonor for our family that we didn't have yep. more kids, you know? Um, so I know that 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 must have been just incredibly difficult for you to go through as well as any other ati mom iblp mom uh that was part of this cult during the late 90s and early 2000s yeah i i agree and you know like i guess i was a little like your mom in that once once we had gone there and i bought the clothes and went to the seminar and you know that type of thing I guess I embraced it until it came time to sit to the table and actually teach the kids. That was really hard because those wisdom booklets, my God, I couldn't figure them out myself. You know, <laughs> and you're supposed to teach these little children. And then, you know, when the spanking had to start, that was horrible. The discipline thing, uh, Michael and Debbie Pearl, they, 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 they were brought up during the Shiny Happy People documentary. Um, and I think everyone yeah. can can agree uh that that was abuse uh, i mean oh, there, there's question. no ifs ands or buts about it that was child abuse the program yeah. that they had this train up a child book and and the videos and the literature yeah. uh about michael and debbie pearl's disciplinary procedures let's call it um it was just plain and simple abuse I think my mom watched that before I mean, she was married or something. Cause like my mom grew up very conservative, very Baptist, Southern Baptist conservative. And she was already on board with the discipline. Mm. And, and so when this, you know, came around, she just saw this amazing um, justification for how, what she was doing and what she wanted to do and it was perfect she was like oh i am doing what's right god is going to honor me because i'm absolutely already got my kids moving in this direction my dad i don't think he would have like he would have gone either way if she had said we want to put the kids in school he'd been like yeah, let's put the kids in school want to homeschool he's like okay let's homeschool i don't think he really had a, a super opinion i think he did eventually he was definitely on board but he was not the mm. one that pushed for it i don't think mm. okay. yeah, that's I, that that's that's very similar to to my family uh where mom was kind of the the driving force uh for iblp and ati christine uh you know you explained how you you got into the shiny happy people cult 
and, and you were kind of dragged into it a little bit. Uh, you were not necessarily a willing participant of the cult initially, but eventually no. you, you kind of warmed up to it, right? Where, where mm -hmm. did you start experiencing doubt about your involvement with IBLP? Well, let's see. We were actually in ATI for 14 years before my marriage broke up. And effectively, when my marriage broke up, that was the end of, of actively being in, in ATI. Um, I guess throughout, I found that there was like, a, a, like as a spiritual gifts go, I'm a teacher. I check things out. And I checked out a lot of Bill Gothard's scriptures and they didn't match up. And I thought this, there's something very wrong unless I am too stupid to understand because there was a lot of that feeling inadequate, not smart enough, not um, savvy enough for anything. But I mean, the Bible is the Bible, right? And you read it and you see what Bill Gothard is saying and you wonder, how did he ever come up with that verse? He probably thought nobody was going to read it. So, <laughs> you know, like being that way, I did not agree. Well, seriously. <laughs> and, you know, and then later on, um, do you all remember Verity College? Oh, of course. Yeah, absolutely. That, that Verity College was the last nail in the coffin for me. We were still in there, but um, my son... Um, he wanted to go to Verity College. So we're in Canada, right? We're living in Montreal. And so anyway, we applied. And I don't think they refused anybody because they wanted all the people they could get. And who wouldn't refuse fast tracking a degree in finance or whatever in, in like 18 months or, or whatever? I, I can't imagine. Anyway, he was accepted. And so then we started the process of, uh, well, how are we going to get him down there? And, uh, you know, like driving is one thing, but um, like getting across the border to go to a school. So we started phoning government, government authorities and all this. And <clears throat> the answer was always, um, oh, what is this Verity College? You can hmm. only come into the States to go to a college if it's an accredited college. So we said, OK. So we phoned back to headquarters and we talked to students. I don't think we ever talked to anybody over 20. And so anyway, um, you know, they would tell us, oh, well, you know, like try something else or whatever. And you could tell them that we're affiliated with Sir Thomas More University. I, I believe that was the name of it. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. It was a scam because after that, you know, they said oh, they mentioned this Sir Thomas More University or whatever. So then we went back to, you know, the immigration, uh, whatever. And, you know, we said, oh, you know, like he'd be getting his degree from this other university. And they looked and they says, well, that's not accredited either. And if you try to get into the States, we're going to ban you if we find out. And we said, OK. So we phoned headquarters again. And to this day, I am so upset that I threw the letter away. But they sent us a letter and told us what to say at the border so that we would be able to get into the States to bring our son to Verity College. And it was all lies. It was wow. all lies. I said to my husband at the time, I said, you see that? I said, they're telling us to lie at the border. I said, we're the ones who are going to be banned from the States mm -hmm. and have a criminal yep. record. Not them, but they're telling us to lie. I said, that's the end of this. He is not going to Verity College. And, you know, my husband did agree. And yet... I mentioned it to all our friends who were in ATI. I said, look, look at this letter. They're telling us to lie at the border. I remember sitting at, going out for supper with, um, with some friends who were also in ATI one night. And I said, you guys, I said, I don't believe a word Bill Gothard says anymore. And I mean, this was, oh, I don't know, 2001, 2002. I said, they told us to lie. Like, I just, I couldn't. I couldn't stop talking about it because I couldn't get over this ultra conservative religious Bible thumping organization would tell us to lie so they could get our money so that our son could go to Verity College and, and what would have happened then. And, you know, that that was that was probably the nail in the coffin. There were cracks before that. 
But when that happened, but my husband, there was no way we were getting out of it. So you go through this process of, of finally starting to understand, okay, there's some inconsistencies within the IBLP organization. And, mm. and a lot of us noticed those same, uh, what, what we would have called at the time, uh, hypocritical thoughts wow. and ideas coming out of the training centers. We all, we all yeah. experienced a lot of that. To control. So, of course. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that they could maintain yeah. that absolute control uh, and tell all yeah. these families that they are exploiting how they have to live their lives in order to please God. Right. And, and that's really yeah. what it was yeah. all about. So you start experiencing some of this doubt, uh, some of this frustration with the program. Yeah. Right. And 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 what was the, the point at which you decided I'm done with this? Well, you could say it was done for me because when my marriage broke up and I insisted on putting my youngest in school, that was the end of ATI. I was done with it. But before the marriage broke up, I couldn't do that because I was under the authority of my husband. I couldn't, I couldn't make that decision. But if he was leaving to be with somebody else, I was done. So your husband left you for another woman while y'all were still in the cult? Yeah. And while he was teaching uh, marriage courses at churches. Wow. And courtship. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I mean, it's just nuts, you know? Yeah. So he was exactly practicing courting. <laughs> so that he could do his whole thing properly. He's like, you know, I didn't court my wife. I better try this out and see how it goes. Better better start over, right? Yeah, can you can you yes, tell me a little bit about probably. what happened there, Christine? Well, he was a very strange type of person. Um anyway, he uh, the boys he he and the boys were, I, I knew nothing. Uh but one summer I got mono. And I thought, how do you get mono when you're monogamous and your home you know that how, how do you get mono and i didn't really question it i went to visit my family in newfoundland that summer and um when i came back of course they all pampered me because here i was with mono and i was tired so i didn't have to do anything which was really nice but my marriage in my marriage my husband had been making so many demands on me like there were times i felt like a giant biological function if you will mm -hmm. and you know there were so many demands it's like i couldn't be me i couldn't be anything and so i thought well maybe if i just go visit my aunt in toronto and visit my family in newfoundland and i visit this one you know then at least i can have a life you know, and I would take my little one with me. But when I came back from Newfoundland that, that summer, that was in um, 2004, came back from Newfoundland with my little guy and um, they were also, the boys and, and their dad were supposed to go to um, paintball one Saturday morning. And, um, you know, I thought, oh, thank God, I get a day to myself just with the little one. And so anyway, like my husband was going around like nervous and, you know, there was something wrong. And he told the, the, the older boys, he said, I don't feel well. You go on without me. And like they were just so disappointed. And then after they had gone, he says, I need to talk to you down in the office. Like this is all outlined in my book. OK, <laughs> it's kind of weird to talk about it. But he says I need he was a chiropractor and his office was in the basement. And so anyway, um, he said, uh, we need to go downstairs and talk. He says, we need, I have to talk to you about something big that may change our lives forever. And I thought, oh, he made a bad investment or something. Like, I mean, nothing could have prepared me for the fact that he was seeing somebody else. Yeah. And I mean, so he told me, and, you know, I'm sitting there in, 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 in his office in the patient's chair and, you know, feeling just like a, what next, you know? And so anyway, he told me, and he, he literally ended his, speech crying on the floor with his head in my lap and i'm looking down and i'm thinking why are you even like what you know and so i said i, I have to go out and so before he said he when when he said he wanted to talk to me downstairs i once heard of somebody going to a doctor for some test results and she thought they might be dire so she says 
I'm going to get all dressed up. I will not hear bad news dressed, you know, down. And so I thought the same thing. So I was all ready to go out. And so when he finished his little speech, I said, well, I'm going shopping. And I went out shopping and I just wandered around and I spent four or $500 on pillows and sheets. It was just, you know, and like, I, I felt like I was in another world. And then after that, um, he went to see her, like within a month, I kicked him out. I had uh, somebody from my church, well, we were house churching, but somebody from the church I used to go to, um, he came out on Thanksgiving weekend and um, he, he changed all the locks. I phoned my ex who was at his girlfriend's place in another town. I said, you can't come back. That's, that's it. Uh, all your stuff will be out at the entrance. You can't come back in the house. Uh, we're done. And cause you know, like I just, that was it. I, I just, mm. there was no mercy on, on my part because I just thought this is the craziest thing I ever heard of. Well, yeah, I think that's completely understandable at this point, Christine, because I mean, he's basically staying with this new girlfriend that he met while he was still married to you in a cult that prides itself on purity culture. Right. Uh, I mean, yeah. just absolutely mind blowing to me, the level of inconsistency uh, and hypocrisy when it's convenient. Right. And, and we've seen this and Bryce, Bryce knows about this stuff, too. We have seen this time and time again. Right. And, and you know, yeah. what's so interesting yeah. is there was a, uh, a family uh, that was very high up in the shiny, happy people cult. And the, the, the dad in this family had an affair with his secretary. And how did IBLP handle that? They released a publication on basically what women need to do to prevent their husbands from cheating on them, which is just insane. It's crazy. Yeah, I, I, I was there for that. At, at Knoxville when it was all announced and we got the letter and all that. But you know, what drives a man to do that? And, you know, like to give the devil his due, my husband, um, I don't think he could handle it anymore. Just, you know, all this purity, this and that, and responsible for the kids, so uber responsible. And, um, you know, I don't know if you're aware, but when, when we used to go to Knoxville every year, um, Early in the morning, like at six o'clock in the morning or something, the fathers would go meet with Bill Gothard. And it would always end up with him saying, don't ever let your daughters go out with or marry a divorced man because divorced men are blah, 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 all these awful things. Well, my ex was divorced and there were other divorced like before he married me. And there were other men in the same position. And they all came out of there feeling like, the lowest of the low. They yeah. felt horrible. And so, you know, you go back for more, hit, hit me again. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying he was a completely evil person, you know, but the way he went about ending our marriage, I don't think he wanted to end it. He came back a year later and I said no, but I, I just, I had, had it with all After this. After it didn't work out with the girlfriend, he came back to you for a second chance exactly exactly wow. and so you know i said no i said i'm happy now i said if i ever marry another man it'll be because he loves me beyond compare and he cherishes me and i said that's not you and that was the end of it and uh <clears throat> excuse me but but that's basically what happened so i i literally kicked him out i said you may not ever come into this house again as long as i'm in it but his clinic was in the basement so he had to go in the clinic door and go out the clinic door. And he had to find a place to live like overnight. And I thought, you made your bed, go lie in it. And so yeah, that's he his did. problem now, right? Yeah, but, exactly, exactly. But we were still in that house for another three or four months before, you know, our, our formal separation was done. And so the kids and I moved into another house that I had bought and, um, but th during those four months, it was brutal because I was home all alone. I used to be a wife who helped her husband with the financials of his business and all that, and a homeschooling mom. 
busy baking and cooking and doing all these things, not really happy, but that's what I was doing. And all of a sudden, I was nothing. I was this woman who sat in the rocking chair and patted the cat and cooked eggs. And I rocked mm. back and forth every day and somebody would come to the door or somebody would phone me or something. And that was all that kept me going. And uh, <clears throat> I, I didn't know anything. I had been rendered um, very helpless from being an ATI. It's funny because we were supposed to teach the children everything we knew, right? And, and yet here was me, the mother, the wife, didn't know which side of the car the gas tank was on. I didn't know how to bring the car through the car wash. I didn't know how to drive to various places. I didn't know how to talk to a man. Yeah. I didn't know how to look a man in the eye because I had been in this thing for so long and I was so indoctrinated. I thought everybody was evil. I literally thought like I used to stand in my kitchen window and I'd cry because like not really because losing my husband because I just there was there was no love left at that point but I would cry because I was hot when I was younger when I was married to him and I ruined my life I wasted my life mm. you know when I look at that picture of of, of that I, I sent you you know I think gee whiz you know I was absolutely gorgeous and I thought I was ugly <laughs> you know and, and that was what was on me and and i think that mothers in ati never feel that they've measured up mm. it's like why did this happen to me because i didn't deserve better that that was my thought all the time and now you know why why do these good things happen to me because i deserve them because i make them happen you know but when we were in shiny happy people cult no you know, and, and even I remember once going through a shopping center with my kids. It was around Christmas time and my my boys were little. And one of them went, you know, oh, mommy, look at the candy. Isn't this nice? You know, I said, yeah, I said, that's for other people's children. What kind of a mother says that to her kid? You know, it was just everything was so controlled. Well, you know, you know, what's interesting to, to me, Christine, and it's, it's something that, that Bryce and I have talked about. And we've talked about it with other, you know, former members that grew up in the cult, right? And and for us, there, there's a recognition for, for some of us, right? So, so some didn't have the same experience. But for me, there's a recognition that my parents were just doing the best that they could with what they had. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they were kind of figuring it out as they were going to, uh, you know, and yeah. they kind of got sold this bill of goods when they got into the shiny, happy people yeah. cult. Right. They went to that basic seminar and Bill Gother told yeah. them, here's how to raise a godly family. Here's how to protect your kids. Here's how to make your kids successful and ensure they go to heaven. Right. That that's all yeah. they were trying to do. Yeah. Um, and, and so we look back on some of these experiences and it's like, how could you how could you fall for this? Well, it's because they didn't know any better. Unfortunately, well, you know, and my mom coming out of her super conservative background and then she's, you know, she's living through the 60s and the 70s, which is all about some some would say all about, you know, debauchery and just doing whatever you wanted. And yeah, and, you know, here's my mother who was always, you know, the obedient daughter. And she's like, how do I keep my kids from getting into all of this? And that was, you know, that was her concern, protect your children from the world. And yep. so she, you know, when she found this, it was perfect. It was like, yep. this is it. This is going to give us what we need. And then I grew up just with an instilled fear of don't disappoint your parents. Don't bring shame on your parents. And so when I decided that it was going to be a divorce, that was my biggest, you know, self abuse of just. And I'm, I'm, I'm marked. I'm, this is going to be, you know, following me around the rest of my life. I'm the first person to get divorced in the family. And mm. my parents surprised me by supporting me. Mm. <laughs> well, aren't you fortunate because, you know, there was, there was a woman that wrote me, I quoted her in my book, but I didn't know her name. And, you know, she had written this, 
thing uh, as a guest blogger back in 2014. And she she talks about um, valuable lessons I learned in, in ATI. And so anyway, one of the things she says was, you know, it's, it's a real testament to God's glory, uh, greatness, when, to see a, a, a suit and floral jumper clad family parading in and out of the sanctuary of church to avoid the backbeat and the rock music. And I quoted her in my book and she wrote me and she said she was absolutely thrilled that I had quoted her and she said, she didn't use her real name when she wrote the article because she was going through a divorce at the time and mm. her parents were siding with her ex. How bad is that? And we see that happen all the time, y you know, where it doesn't matter what is happening in the marriage, right? It doesn't matter the unhappiness, the, the abuse that could potentially be occurring. None of that matters because in order to please God, you have to stay in that marriage, period, end of sentence. Um, and really the only reason to leave a marriage possibly and still maintain, you know, your, your standing uh, in the church or, or with the cult uh, is infidelity. That's, that's the only way to get out of it, right? If your partner was, was unfaithful, then maybe we can make an exception and y'all can get a divorce. But other than that, no way. You know, that's all fine and well. But when I ended up alone in my rocking chair, I thought, well, I must phone headquarters now and, and let them know that we're not doing ATI anymore and tell them why. And I spoke to some youngster. I mean, this is an adult problem. Your husband leaves you. You're here with the kids. You don't know which end is up. And, and then I followed it up with a letter that we were resigning from ATI because this is what happened in our life. No response. None. None. Mm. I, I couldn't believe it. I thought this organization that controlled us for all those years had no support for me when, you know, my life fell apart. That, that mm. was devastating. I've, I've often wondered what happens to families uh, that fall apart like that. Um, mm. you know, the, the family that I referenced earlier, they were such a big deal within the Institute, uh, as leaders in the cult at, you know, not at the very top, but close to it. Um, I have their cookbook. And, oh, you do? <laughs> I do. <laughs> so, yep. so, you know, there was support for them, uh, but for just a, a regular family, just trying to figure things out in this high demand, high control organization. Um, there is no support. You know, I, I have to say there were a couple of uh, interactions I had of divorced women and their children being on staff and living in training centers. It wasn't very common, but there were some of them were there. And looking back, I can see that they were not treated the same. Mm -hmm. They they were definitely, there was a unnecessary shame attachment. And, and the one family that I interacted with the most, and she's wonderful. She's a lovely woman and her daughters were lovely. She actually friend requested me like a week ago on Facebook. I was like, oh, it's good to hear from her. And, uh, and it was just unnecessary. Yeah. I don't even know what her story was. I have no idea why she was divorced and living at the training center with the family. It's always it always was like, oh, we're helping her out or whatever the case may be. It's like, yes, you know, you're getting free labor, and there's no husband involved to say, no, my wife can't do that. We want to do. She's got to take care of the children or attend to education. It was just like free labor, and we'll put her in charge of, you know, well, it was it was or something. It was also like they were they were pitied essentially mm. right I, I wouldn't say that so they were treated horrible. as second class citizens but there was absolutely just this oh that poor thing y you know she's just never going to be the same again because she managed to lose her husband probably because she just wasn't doing her wifely duties and receiving her husband joyfully and so he was forced to succumb to the devil and leave yeah. her Oh, my God. You know, there was a book that um, Debbie Pearl wrote. I don't know if you heard of it. It was called Created to Be His Helpmeet. 
and basically oh it's a horrible horrible i bought it and i ate it up and i just i i, I just got rid of it at a second uh second hand bookstore a couple of years ago here and i go there all the time it's still there i wonder why but <laughs> In, I think you need to burn the, that one, actually, Christine. Oh I don't think that's that back. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you know, she her her opinion is that if your husband leaves you, it's your fault. Of course, and and, and it's like it's like you said, Davy. Like she, if if your husband leaves you, then it's because you're not you fill in the blank. But it's always your fault. Not that he just decided he's to stray or whatever. It's always the woman's fault. And and that that's a pretty heavy burden to bear. But, you know, going back to a divorced woman or a divorced person in the church or, or whatever, I found that, I mean, it was very shameful for me to have my husband leave. I felt like I had a big banner on my forehead that said, my husband left me because I was no good. And, you know, like I, I was just, I was mortified. I, I, my, my head was in the gutter. For, for months and months and months. And I just kept thinking, if only I, anything, he wouldn't have left. But, you know, I think that his leaving was like a tsunami. But there's a shame attached to being divorced anyway. You know, like I found that once I was divorced, um, some, some families took pity on me and the kids and invited us over for dinner, but the conversation would swirl around and I wouldn't be part of it because I didn't fit in anymore. And another time, the, the children and I were invited to another family's place for supper. And um, we decided to have a game of cards or something after the meal. And my friends, the parents, they left to go watch something on TV and they left me with all the children. Mm. I mean, how to feel rejected, horrible, miserable. They were very kind to us, but it, that was really hard. That, that so you was, really uh, did uh, experience that second class citizen treatment. Absolutely. Uh, and that's just how unfortunate, how awful uh, for someone. You're already dealing with this trauma, right? Uh, and now let's pile on being a social pariah at the same time. I mean, I'm so sorry, Christine. Oh, thank you. But you know. I was going to say it's all good. Um, you know, back in 2014, when I found Recovering Grace and I ate it up, I called each of my children and I said, guys, we were in a cult. ATI is a cult. And they just laughed at me. And, and I said, guys, if you want to talk about it, you know, I'm, I'm here because I just, I just feel horrible. And my youngest, who was effectively put in school in grade five, so he didn't have the brunt of it like the other two, he believed me because by now he was in university. And, you know, he said, it's about time you realized it, mom. But the other two, they didn't until um, last month, shiny, happy mm. people. And I told my one son, the one, the one Davey who had, had me, you got to watch this guy, <laughs> you know. So I watched your, your interview there with, with Lindsay, and that's when I wrote you. But he said, you, 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 uh, you got to watch this guy. And so anyway, I had, I had said to Steve, um, you've got to watch Shining Happy People. You really understand. I mean, even after I wrote my book and, and talked about the cult and this and that and the other thing, he read the book. He thought it was hilarious. It was just, it didn't, it didn't really go in. And then, you know, he was, said he was going to watch Shiny Happy People, but he didn't. And then he ran into an old friend from our house church. Their family weren't in ATI, but they, had, they did everything that we did, the homeschooling, the dresses, the this, the that. And sure. anyway, he met his friend, and she had fallen on really hard times in her family, with her children, everything. So they went out for a coffee, and... She says, Steve, did you watch Shiny Happy People? And he said, Mom has been after me to, to watch it. So, you know, because she watched it, he went home and he watched it. And he watched it again. He watched it twice. And then he told me, and I said, now you've got to go read Recovering Grace. And he read the whole thing. Like, he mm. stayed up all night reading it. And now, finally, all these years later, he's going through the fallout 
of realizing I am who I am now because of what happened to me in my past. And I got to say that I have the best relationship with my three boys of anybody I know. And, you know, if there's one message to put out there to parents, it's, you know, acknowledge, apologize, admit I was wrong. Gosh, I wish I hadn't done it. My kids have forgiven me a thousand times over. And, you know, and they say what you said, Davy, mom, you were just doing what you thought was right, you know? And I said, yeah, it was just that it was so wrong and it was so hurtful. And, you know, this is, eh, we're good. And like, they tell me everything now. They tell me more than I wish, I, more than I want to hear. But, but it's, it's good because before they told me nothing, you know? And, and like, so I, I really, it was humbling to say to them, you know what? We were barking up the wrong tree for all those years. And, you know, when we should have been loving on you kids instead of disciplining you, you know, I'm sorry. And even the paddle, when it, uh, I, I spoke about that earlier, when I moved from Quebec to Nova Scotia, where I am now, I was unpacking things one time and I came across the paddle. And so I showed it to my youngest son. I said, hey, look at this. He said, I don't know why you think that's funny. He said, that is a symbol of the worst thing imaginable. He says, I hate that thing. He said, and, and he just went on and on and on. And I said, oh, I'm so sorry. I just, you know, and so I went and I put it in the fireplace and I lit a fire and I burnt it. And I told him, I said, I burnt the paddle. And, you know, he says, good. He says, you know, you know, but like you win your kids back by degrees. And that was one of the things, you know, you know, it's, it's so interesting to me, Christine, because just like we didn't really understand what our parents were going through while, while we were in the shiny, happy people cult. And, and a lot of times parents don't know what the kids were going through. So just like that paddle for your son was something that wasn't funny at all. It was a reminder of severe trauma that he experienced. Oh, yeah. There yeah. are things that you had to deal with that your kids yeah. will never understand uh, as far as how you suffered uh, while you were part of this cult. Um, you, you know, so it's just it's just such an interesting point, um, you know, kind of looking back and seeing, boy, we were all going through our own challenges. Oh, yeah. Uh, while Absolutely. we were still active in this cult from yeah. a, from a child's perspective, from a teen's perspective, from a parent's perspective. Um, it's just, um, it, you know, I, I think the thing to me that, that, that is such a powerful message, right? It is such a powerful message being able to, to say, boy, I was wrong and I want to make this right with my kids. Cause there's, there's a lot of folks out there who still aren't ready to do that. Um, you know, it took my parents a while. Um, I, I, you know, Bryce and I have talked about this multiple times. His parents still aren't ready to, to, do, to do that. Um, and it's so it's, hurtful, though, you know, like when you have, you know, your parents that don't even talk to you or, or whatever. I, I don't know. I, you know, I was active on Instagram with my book and all that type of thing. And... I mentioned something in reference to somebody's post at one point and somebody replied and they thanked me. You know, they said, if only we could hear what you said from our own mothers, but we probably mm. never will. And it just made me so sad. That's what's resonating with me right now. And, and I, your boys are so lucky and it's, it's so wonderful that you're able to come to these realizations and talk to them and, and admit that you made a mistake. And I don't know if my parents have seen any of these and mm -hmm. I have spent years talking to them and I haven't really spoken to them. And I don't know if they think that I, this is what I want. This is not what I want. I don't want to not have a relationship with my parents. I want to have that relationship. I want to tell them what's going on in my life, but not at my emotional and mental no, anymore. Not, it's worth just not worth it. it. No, no, it's not. And I mean, you know, sometimes, you know, 
since I've been out of the cult, if you will, um, I've learned what boundaries are and I respect my kids' boundaries like hugely. And, you know, I just wish, you know, Bryce, like, like yourself, I wish other parents could learn that. And, you know, at first I thought, you know, I went to visit my kids in Montreal there last year and they said, oh, mom, we can't wait for you to come. And I said, really? I said, I can't imagine anybody can't wait to see me, you know, but they love you and I love them and your parents love you. It's just that when you're not ready, it's really hard, but you know, you've got to keep your own boundary. This is the life that you want to live. And, you know, my kids live lives that I might not have approved of a few years ago, and maybe I don't approve of them now, but I don't care. They're my kids and I love them. And whatever they do, I'll be there with them. I'll have their back no matter what. And, and they know it. They absolutely know it. And, you know, like, I don't know. It's, it's really important. It really is. You're getting, you're getting years back. You are making up time and that's what's great. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think so. I think so. So you get out of the cult. Um, you repair these relationships with your children, which is just amazing to hear. Um, you write a book. Uh, and, and, and walk me through the timeline real quick, because you, you got out of the cult, I think you said around 2003. 2004, yeah. Okay. So you get out of the cult. Some years go by as you're kind of rediscovering yourself learning how to be a, a normal functioning member of society again, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, you discovered recovering grace in 2014, and that's when all the light bulbs flipped <laughs> on for you, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and then you wrote the book. Uh, and, and what year did you write the book? Uh, I just wrote it. I published it in June 22. Oh, wow. So this was just last year. Oh, yeah. Like it was very well timed <laughs> with shiny, happy people. I mean, yeah, and and I've got to say that, you know, like you're saying, oh, you got out of the cult and you went back to living like a normal person, but I didn't. I started wearing pants, but I felt guilty every time I did. I still had very strong opinions on certain orientations and all that type of Mm. thing. I, I had a really hard time. The thing was, is that I wasn't, my body wasn't in the cult anymore, but my mind was. Mm. And it was only after recovering grace and then getting on the um, parent recovery group on Facebook that I started understanding that was wrong. That was wrong. You're not supposed to do that. That's those those men and women on that group really, really helped me. And Mm. writing my book. It took me four years because at first I was afraid of writing it because I didn't want to upset my children. I didn't want to inflame my ex. I didn't know if I should put myself right out there. And I belonged to a writing group. And what I would do is like every every time we would meet, I'd have some little thing about my life in the cult. And um, by and by, I had enough for a book and I got a lot of encouragement from my writing group. And I changed every name in the book, every single Mm. one except mine and my present husband's. And I never mentioned my children by name at all because Mm. it was it wasn't their story. It was my story. And yeah, it was um, it was tough. And but writing the book was so cathartic for me Um, as the time goes on after having published the book. Um, I think I've got, I'm gaining more and more confidence in myself and in who I am because I had none, absolutely none. And, you know, now, I mean, I'm here talking to you guys that, that would never have happened, you know, before. (laughs) And and we're so glad you are. Uh, I, I, I think I just heard a really interesting fact. Uh, you did end up getting remarried, Christine. So you found the guy that's going to love you unconditionally. Well, yes, I did. Yep. How cool. So, Pants what? and all. Wow. <laughs> Pants <laughs> and all. <laughs> yeah. No kidding. One of the questions that, uh, that we get a lot uh, from, from viewers on, on YouTube in the comments is, uh, do, do we, 
uh, myself and Bryce, do we still consider ourselves Christians? Uh, and, and I'd love to, you know, kind of hear your thoughts on that. I mean, are, are, do you still identify <laughs> as as a Christian? Yeah, I do. Um, I actually belong to a church, but I don't go. Um, actually, since I published my book, I've been pulling back more and more and more because, and it's not that the church that I'm affiliated with now has done damage to me, although we did have a pastor who did damage me a lot, um, and he's gone. And but but I just I get there now and they sing um, oh what's that one trust and obey and I'm just mm. I'm brought right back right mm -hmm. back it's just a little Presbyterian church non judgmental uh, welcomes welcomes everybody inclusive of every kind of person and yet when I hear that song I I don't cry anymore but. I can't sing it. I will mm. not sing it. And so am I still a Christian? <sighs> it's really hard. I, I, you know what? I'm on the fence. I'm really mm. on the fence right now. I, at the moment, I believe in God. I got rid of every Bible I ever owned. There's none in the house. I'm not interested because anything I read brings back horrible memories. And, mm. um, but I love going to church sometimes because I really love the people. And I know that's real shallow, but um, that's, there you have it. I love the people and, you know, um, I, we get together with them all the time. But as for going to church, hmm, I don't like it. I, I like to say I, I've served my, I've served my time. I, <laughs> I am so over organized religion i'm yeah. just there's so any little bit of power structure and uh people will run away with it take advantage of it yeah. let it go to their head i'm just i'm cannot stand it i have several people there's a couple people in my life that i refer to as like my favorite christians because they <laughs> exhibit what you would you would you read about jesus in the new testament it's like yeah. this person hangs out with me for me he doesn't ask me to go to church every time he doesn't say let me pray over you he doesn't he does not put his his belief upon you yeah. every chance they get we just are friends i know what how he feels he knows how i feel yeah. we don't dance around anything if he wants to pray over a meal it's his business he prays over a meal but he doesn't he doesn't pull you and make you be a part of right. his yeah. thing and yeah. to me that's that's great. And I, and I love him for that. And that's, that's what I like, but I do not want to be involved in organized. Religion. No. And you know, it was interesting because in 2015, I was, I think it was 2015. I was ordained as an elder in my church and I had no idea what that meant. I, I just said, okay. And I hated it so much. It was a six year term. And then hit thank god because i hated it so much and then i said i can't do this anymore i'm stepping down and i did and since then oh i might have darkened the doors like not even a dozen times and as yeah. we sit here i haven't been inside the church in months and i i'm not inclined to go well and i think that's everyone's personal prerogative right yeah um yeah. I, I often say that uh, while I still consider myself a Christian, I know that there are a lot of people out there who yeah. would beg to differ <laughs> and would say that I am absolutely not. On some of the uh, podcast episodes that we did as part of the Surviving the Shiny Happy People cult, um, a couple times we mentioned uh, how interesting the swimwear was for women that were in the cult, and you actually brought it up real briefly, and I just wanted to show this picture of you and a friend wearing your modest bathing suits and let's take a look here just let's just do a quick modesty check on this uh might be showing a little bit too much leg quite honestly bryce i don't know is this creating a stumbling i just want to know 
I want to know how these Canadian women are so freaking tan. Like I can see that their feet are glowing, right? But that is what I look like <laughs> top to bottom. And I've been in Texas my whole life. But these women are out here tan except for their feet. But yeah, no, this is a problem. I can see knees and everything. I mean, the, the knee exposure uh, seems like it could it could be a, a, a lust trap, if you will. Um, but I mean, other than that, I mean, look, we've got the shoulders covered up. We've got full length uh, skirts attached to these swimsuits. And then we have the the shorts underneath. Like, like I said, I think those could probably be a little bit looser, a little bit longer. <laughs> And, and then we would be well. At least the cleavage is completely suffocated. Oh my True. god! <laughs> yeah, these are these are all the way up to the neck. Um, but but this, as funny as it is, this is exactly what people were dealing with in the shiny happy people cult. You had to find these kinds of crazy solutions for something as simple as a swimsuit. Yep. Uh, so that you didn't get judged by your friends in the cult as being a whore essentially exactly exactly you know, and it's just so wild but i love that you shared this uh this second picture christine and this is you and the same friend today mm-hmm. um it was last week oh this is last week oh yeah. perfect yeah it's it's interesting to me because it's almost like uh the, <laughs> the swimsuits have about as much coverage as your normal clothes now yeah uh, exactly. which is which is pretty funny <laughs> Yep. I, I have to bring up, uh, I don't know if you heard, we heard a rumor that uh, this this year or last year, Bill Gothard gave uh, all the staff his new book auto, and it's autographed. And I feel you should do the same with your, your friends. Just give them <laughs> your book and autograph it. Well, I do. Yeah. When and I... send one to Bill. Yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> Make sure he sees it. I should. Um, I should. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, this has been just so interesting hearing a parent's perspective on the shiny, happy people cult. Uh, it's been refreshing, you know, knowing that there are folks out there like you uh, yeah, that recognize lots. how damaging this cult was for their kids uh, and that have made a concerted effort to try to, to, try to make things right. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for telling us your story. Uh, where can people buy your book? I know people are going to want to know. So how do they find your book? This is my book. It's called Behind the Dress. And that was me back in the cult. And you notice I'm dressed down to the ankles, down to the wrists, up to the neck. And it's available on all Amazon platforms in um, soft cover and Kindle. And so you, you look for behind the dress book and you'll find it. And, you know, like there's the picture. But, um, yeah, I've gotten some wonderful reviews on it. So that's where they can find me and uh, or find the book. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. And how about uh, how about social media? Is there anywhere that uh, people can follow you online uh, if, in case they want to send you a message or ask more questions or just talk? Absolutely. I'm on Facebook under my own name. Um, and I, I have two Facebook accounts. One is just my own name, Christine Fowler, And the other one is Christine Fowler author. And so either one of them. And I'm also on Instagram under my same name, Christine Fowler. Not too hard to find. Christine, thank you again so much for joining us. Uh, really appreciate uh, hearing about your experience in the Shiny Happy People cult. Thank you all so much for watching. Uh, as always, we love you. <laughs>